bringing it up. That power, that Holy Spirit that God gives us, He's giving you everything that you need to be successful as a Christian the moment you got saved. Everything you need. The Bible describes us as newborn babes in Christ that desire the sincere milk of the Word. When I got saved, I had a desire for God's Word. Where did that come from? God gave it to me. Why did He give me that? Because He knew I needed the Word in order to grow. So He gave me a desire for the Word. When I wasn't saved, I cared less about God. I could care less about the Word of God. But God gave me that for a particular purpose so that I could grow. And so God gives you everything you need. The power is already in you to do His will. The question is, are you willing? Are you willing? Number four, when a man is doing what God designed and programmed him to do, he will do it better, with less effort, and with greater inner satisfaction than he does anything else. I remember when I was in here. I'm going to pick on him for a minute. Just because I can't. Amen. That's, that's, that's one of the only few perks I get as a new pastor, so I can do that. But I remember the first time he preached his first message. You want to know how long it was? I sneezed and it was over. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not discrediting him. I was probably the same way. And, but today, he's, every day I know he surrendered more and more to God's will. I see him today being a second year Bible college student, and I can see how much he's grown. As he's continuing to look back at his life and see what God has already done, and as he looks forward to see what God's already doing. And not a day, ask him if he enjoys doing what he's been doing all week or since he's got home. Ask him if he enjoys what he's doing over at his school, on that bus ride, going with those bus kids. Ask him if he's having a good time. Ask him if it seems like the easiest thing he's ever done. Because there's battles, there's struggles, but he knows that he's in God's will. Talk to him about it, he'll tell you. That's right. Number five, when a man is doing God's will, he will be happier than enjoying anything else. He can do. Now, the Lord kind of snuck up on me on this one. See, I played college basketball. My dream was like anybody else would play professional basketball. So, you know what? I'm going to play professional basketball and make all this money, and everything else is history. To live happily ever after. And that was my goal. But little did I know that I had a knee injury. God began to bring things in my life, but on the inside, I was so miserable. I was so torn apart. And one of the things that God did to me for me before I got saved is He began to slowly take my desire away from basketball. To the point where I got to the point where I could take basketball where I could leave it. And then shortly after that, he saved me and he called me to preach. I knew that's what God was doing. What I'm saying is, is this. I, 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 I can take basketball and leave it. When God saved me and called me to preach, I would rather preach than do anything else, folks. My wife will tell you, I enjoy, I look forward to it every week because I know that I'm in God's will. I'm telling you, you will never be able to do any job, no matter how much money you make. If it's not God's will, you're not going to be completely satisfied. You know you're in God's will. And you know you're living for him and pleasing him. Man, it's just something about that. God gives you this peace that surpasses all understanding. There's, I just cannot describe it. And that's what we're talking about tonight. I mean, it's so easy for me to do God's will because I know that's where he has me to be. Well, the question is, is, is this. If, is everything you're saying in past will is true, then why are so many people that don't do God's will? I want to give three quick points and we'll begin to close tonight that explains why this is the case. Number one, I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, if you will. You know, first of all, when you get saved, Satan's number one thing to do is to keep you from doing God's will, to keep you from being a testimony for him. If he can do that, he's done his job. Because what he wants to do is keep people out of heaven, and he knows that if you step up to serve God, there'll be less people in eternity. Well, how does he do this? I'm going to give you three ways in which he does this. Number one, he does this, first of all, by making you think you can do your will and what? God's will at the same time. Mm. Let me say it again. He does it by making you think you can do your will and God's will at the same time. Let me ask you a question. Can you do God's will and your will at the same time? No. No, because if your will is in it, it's your will, it's not God's will. He doesn't mix his will with your will. Amen? Unless your heart delights in him. And then you'll be on the same page. Well, we see a story in 1 Samuel, but I even mentioned this earlier, where, so, where, where the prophet uh, came to King Saul and, and through God, it says, I want you to utterly destroy all the Amalekites. I want you to kill everything. Y'all heard about this this morning, remember? Well, let's look at what it says in verse 3. It says, Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, and cattle and ass. So he says, I want you to, to destroy everything. Well, immediately when he said that, a little thought came into Saul's mind. Satan came to him. It says, Saul almost obeyed everything God took the same place one thought. Why should you slaughter all those sheep? They would make excellent possessions for you to be able to sacrifice them to God later. You can slaughter them and sacrifice to God and not use your own flock. You'll be saving your sheep and doing exactly what God told you to do. So Satan began to put these things. And he says, for ultimately you will slaughter all those sheep anyway. 
away. And so he begins to put these thoughts in his mind. And so Saul lost his kingdom for a few sheep. If you look at verse 13, look what it says there. It says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And so here he is. I perform the commandment of the Lord. And here's Saul. Uh, Samuel comes toward him. He's saying, oh, I did exactly what God told me to do. See, God knew his heart. And even though he thought he did what God told him to do, deep down inside, he knew he didn't. God told him to destroy everything. But he didn't do that. He saved the best of everything. Really, it wasn't a sacrifice for God. It was a sacrifice for himself, to keep for himself. Let me ask you a question. Can you give a sacrifice to God that does not cost you anything? No. No. See, if I take something that belongs to somebody else, and I try to offer that to God, that's not a sacrifice. Sacrifice has to cost you something in order for it to be a real sacrifice. God wants your heart. God wants your life. He wants everything before he can do what he wants to do with your life. And that's the way it works. And so we see here that as the prophet Samuel came to him, he says, well, Samuel, what is that bleeding of the sheep that I hear? You heard the bad, hear the animals. He says, obviously you didn't kill everything because I hear something going on back there, you know? And so we see that Saul tried to cover it up. But you know what? We can't hide things from God. And it says in verse 20, let's see what it says here. It says, And Saul said to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. You think this Saul would get right with God, but he still continues to cover up his sin. He says, And yet I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord has sent me, and have brought Agog, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And then look at what, Saul, or what Samuel replies to. He says this, he says in verse 21, But the people took of the spoil of the sheep, and the oxen and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. What he says there, that should what? Have been utterly destroyed, but they weren't. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than. And sacrifice. Here we see here that he says here, he gives Saul a way that he can know God's will. He said, this is the way you know God's will. To obey is better than sacrifice. You know, that message that I even brought to you guys earlier, that's the key to God's will to obey. Remember Brother Jeremy said? He says, if you obey now, what would that do for you 10 years from now? Mm. What did, what, remember what he said? What did he say? Mm -hmm. If you obey now, what's going to happen 10 years from now? You want me to tell you, you pastor, you weren't listening to him? You don't want me to tell him that, do you? Anybody remember what he said? Let me put it to you this way. The decisions you make today are molding the person you're going to be in the future. You can't wait until you become an adult and then make the right decision. It's too late. <clears throat> Trust me, it's too late. The mistakes you make today are going to affect you for the rest of your life. It's too late to do that. You've got to make that decision today. And so I want to give you a couple of scenarios, you know. Isn't it funny how most people say that, you know what, I can, I can serve God and still play ball, and usually like five foot two, no offense if you're short, but and they have no chance to play professional sports. <laughs> That's typically the way it works. Or even if you do happen to make it to a professional level, let's say for example, I think of Peyton Manning, how many of you know who he is? Anybody know what his condition is right now? His neck's no good. Have they been talking about Peyton Manning that much this year? No. When you get hurt, what does professional sports do? They kick you to the side. What does God do? He never does that. Right. He never does that. You can't go wrong serving God, folks. The world just tosses to the side when you're all done up. That money will be spent up. But God's will will endure forever. That's what I'm talking about, folks. That's what it's all about. You say, well, you don't understand what I'm saying. Well, my daddy was a fireman, and his daddy was a fireman, and I can't break that heritage. But what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to do? It's bigger than your heritage. Now, if you want to be a fireman, that's great. And that's what God's will is for your life. But if that's not what God's calling you to do, you need to do God's will, folks. That's what it's all about. You know, we can rationalize all day. You know, sometimes we compromise this way. You know, I can do my will and God's will and say, you know what? I want to go witness to the God people. I want to paint my fingernails black like they do so I can reach them. You'll never find a compromise in the scripture. You can't do your will and God's will. God's will is not that you be like them and reach them. But the Bible says it will procure your people. You need to be different. That's what they admire. When they see something different in you, you're actually drawing attention of God to them. And that's what God wants to see. You know, we can rationalize and wait to make our plans better than God's plan, but it will never work. You know, I know a young man that was in my youth group many years ago. He grew up in a very poor situation. I mean, very poor. His dad left the family when he was younger. He had four sisters. And two of his sisters were already pregnant as a teenager and had two or three kids already. And so he came to me one day and says, Pastor Will, I believe God has called me to preach. 
I go, well, praise the Lord. We started a little preacher boy class. There were like five or six guys in that preacher boy class. And we started a preacher boy class. And I remember just like it was yesterday. He was going through this class. He was getting excited about serving God. And then all of a sudden, he came to me one day. He says, man, I think I want to be a chemical engineer. He said, well, I think that's what I want to do. I want to go to, the, to this university, this second university. And he says, and if I do that, then I'll be able to make enough money. This is what he said. I'll be able to make enough money that I can help my family. You want to tell you what happened to him? Let's just say he went over there and he got this girl pregnant out of wedlock. lock. He, he's not serving God today. And his family is still in poverty. Not only are they in physical poverty, but they're, they're in spiritual poverty. Many of them are still lost. They still don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. He didn't do much at all to help his family. Because you know why? He got out of God's will. You can't try to calculate, folks. You can't try to figure it out. You just need to trust God and do his will. That's what it's all about. Number two, by making a person think that God's will will make them miserable. You ever heard about Jonah? How I many have heard of Jonah? What did God call Jonah to go? <laughs> to Nineveh. Now, let me put this in perspective for you. What would happen if you went to Iraq today and tried to take your Bible and go preach over there? What would they do to you? Shoot you. Right, shoot you. As soon as you open your mouth, they shoot you in the back of the head and you'd be dead, right? Would anybody do anything about it? No. Probably not. This was Nineveh. This was Nineveh. Now, imagine God calling you to go to Nineveh. Would you go? Don't answer that. Hey, Amen. <laughs> Don't answer that. And so as we look at this story, we'll find that Jonah did not want to go to this city. Matter of fact, he had the wrong part. He says, you know what? I need, not only do I not want to go to Nineveh, but I wish God would curse them and they'd die. I wish he'd just have a lightning bolt come down from heaven and just strike them and kill them all. I don't have anything to do with Nineveh. I mean, they were just a wicked, wicked place. But he knew in his heart that if he went, God would cause those people to repent because God was calling them. But he didn't want them to repent. He didn't want them to get right with God because he wanted God to what? To judge them. You see that? And so, therefore, he began to think of his heart. Well, if I do God's will, I'll just be miserable. If I preach to those people, they'll surely repent because I'm a great preacher, you know. And they'll get right with God. He was patting himself on the back, but we know that's not the case. Those fellows will come in here and take all of us captive, and it'll be all my fault. And if that didn't get to him, he would say something like this. What if they don't repent? First, I'll look like an idiot. And second, regardless of what they do, I'll be done for forever in Israel. I'll never be able to go back to Israel high and face my friends. They'll think I'm a holier than now. They won't want to hang out with me because I won't be cool anymore if I do God's will. You get my point? See, Jonah didn't want to do that. He did not want to do God's will. He did not want to trust God. He thought that doing God's will would make him absolutely miserable. And we know that is not the case. You know what? Can I say this? That when you graduate from high school... Most of the people that you went to school with probably won't even see you ever again. <clears throat> Let me say it again. Most of the people you went to high school with probably won't ever see you again. You know, I'll just tell you this. If it wasn't for Facebook, I probably wouldn't have seen many of the people I went to high school with anyway. And that's just the truth. It really doesn't matter what they think. You know, we know that God wants us to serve Him, but then there are other things that we think are more fun. You know, for some reason, we always have in our mind that God, if I surrender my life to God, I, I let him call me to service. He'll call me down to Africa, and I'll live with a little pig knees and some little bamboo butt, and I'll be miserable forever. We think that of God, but that is not the case. You know, I know a missionary right now that surrendered 40 years of his life to the mission field, and he owns, and it's not about material things, but he owns three properties. I know a pastor friend of mine right now who surrendered to serve God as a full-time pastor. He went to this place where he was going to serve, and they gave him a house. Just gave it to him. You cannot give God, folks. I know people who work 30, 40 years to pay for a house, and he was just given one. Doing God's will. There's no substitute for doing God's will. Ask your youth pastor. Ask your pastor if they ever regret doing God's will. I guarantee you they'll say, I'm having the most fun I've ever had in my life. Number three, by making a person judge by feelings and by outward appearance. This is what Satan wants to do. He wants us not to look. We look at God's way of living, and we look at it and say, well, that's not for me. And if we look over here, this looks much better. Turn your Bibles if you can to Genesis chapter 13. We'll begin to close here. Genesis chapter 13. 